Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for February 28th, 2022. I'm your host, Jeanette Dapheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is presenting the results of the Trusted CI Annual Challenge on Software Assurance. Our presenters are Dr. Sean Peisert, Alyssa Heyman, and Professor Barton Miller. Um, Sean leads the Applied Research and Development. Sean leads Applied Research and Development in Computer Security at Berkeley Lab in UC Davis. He's also Chief Cybersecurity Strategist for CNIC. Alyssa is a senior scientist at the University of Wisconsin Madison and Associate Professor of the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And Professor Bart is a computer scientist. Um, he's a professor in computer science at the University of um, Wisconsin Madison. And all three of you are members of Trusted CI, which is why you're presenting on this topic today. And uh, before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, second, participants are welcome to ask questions using the chat. We'll take questions um, as the presentation progresses, but we've also planned for time at the end for questions as well. With that, I'll hand things over to Sean. Sean, welcome. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you all today. Um, I have the pleasure of starting us off, um, but uh, in fact, uh, uh, Bart and Alyssa and I will be co-presenting this, so uh, um, please excuse as we uh, uh, pass the baton here and there. Um, the three of us um, are part of uh, Trusted CI, but more specifically, the three of us are part of an effort that took place last year to study software assurance in scientific computing. Um, the team was actually uh, about twice our size. We had uh, six, perhaps seven people working on this uh, over the course of last year. Uh, Alyssa, next slide, please. Um, and uh, this, uh, the, the uh, the whole process was part of what we call an annual challenge. Uh, so each year for the past several years, Trusted CI has taken on a specific topic of interest that requires an in-depth examination uh, in our view. And last year specifically uh, focused on software assurance or, or issues regarding the robustness and security of software developed for use in scientific computing processes. Um, the first half of the year focused on really understanding the problem. Uh, of software assurance. How is software developed? What are some of the issues that come, come up? What are some of the problems that uh, those issues lead to? The second half of the year took uh, place uh, uh, to document our findings, as well as to develop a roadmap or a guide that could be used by organizations developing software to help improve the robustness of their software. And the goals of this, were to, uh, this process are broadly to help improve the quality of software developed in scientific computing with respect to robustness and security. This isn't the only um, uh, pro, uh, 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 focus, or this isn't the only way that Trusted CI focuses on software assurance. And in fact, Bart and Alyssa have been doing this for quite a, quite a number of years very successfully um, through a number of their training processes and through engagements with this process specifically focused on really digging in deep into the problem and understanding it better. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So these are the two documents that we produced last year, and these are intended to be living documents that will be updated over time. The first is uh, uh, documents our findings and, and what we learned in interviewing five different um, prominent organizations developing software for use in scientific computing. And we thank all five of those organizations for their contributions, by the way. The second is the guide uh, that is designed to help um, uh, scientific software developers uh, going forward. And again, this, this will be updated over time as we continue to learn new things about software development, as we continue to gather more information that could be of use to scientific software developers as well. And please uh, download and uh, read these and send us your comments and questions uh, at the URL below, trustedci.org slash software assurance. There's also a link to that from the Trusted CI homepage. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and dive right into our findings, uh, which is divided into several different categories, as you'll, you'll see. And um, we're gonna hand off a little bit uh, as we go between these. Um, so I will kick this off. Um, um, uh, 
actually, so I, I yes, with this. So um, first, let's start with some positive notes about uh, what, what we found, because yes, we did find some things that concerned us a lot, but we'd like to start with some things that we, we felt were very positive and some of the things that um, we're glad that we found used. And hopefully many of you who are developing software are also using some of these uh, uh, elements as well. So the good news is uh, all of the projects that we interviewed are in fact using repositories of some kind. And so uh, this generally meant uh, code repositories that is software re related to software version control. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think it was in every case that one of these organizations were using centralized software version control uh, as well. And so that, that means things like GitHub and GitLab, uh, which are long lived, um, uh, high quality tools for tracking software, integrating a number of different automated processes with the, that software in many cases, uh, allow commenting, bug tracking, um, uh, pull requests, all sorts of modern software development methodologies. Um, in fact, um, just relating to bug and issue tracking, GitHub and GitLab certainly have those built in. Um, some of the, the software projects that we interviewed also used tools like Jira and RT, uh, that are, are uh, 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 analogous tools uh, uh, to some of the issue tracking in GitHub and GitLab for bug and issue tracking as well. Another positive uh, uh, element that we found was that all of the projects were using standard libraries for cryptog cryptography. Um, I bring this up because uh, it's uh, something we say in computer security that it's a bad idea to what we say roll your own cryptography. And so uh, people who, who um, uh, decide they, they're um, uh, amateur uh, cryptographers and decide to build, build their own algorithm is usually not a good idea. And we didn't find anybody trying to do that. And that may seem like a minor thing, but given the importance of cryptography, it's a really good thing that people are using a lot of the standard libraries that are out there um, that uh, could be used for uh, and, and linked uh, via uh, their C or Python code or whatever it happens to be. Um, uh, most of the projects are also using what we call modern languages. So uh, these are languages that have type and memory safety, uh, things like Java and Python, uh, and uh, largely not using older languages like C and C++ that are often performant, but uh, allow you to shoot yourself in the foot so easily uh, through the lack of type and memory safety uh, that, that they carry with them. Um, and um, uh, this isn't to say that Java and Python can't be performant, because a lot of the libraries that Java and Python use are, in fact, have um, some robust C uh, the, the, and performant C that's, that's kind of under the hood, if you will. But um, so the software developers themselves, not having to write in C and C++, uh, can help improve security and robustness so much. We're really glad to see that um, modern languages are being used there. Again, also, most of the projects are using dependency tracking tools. This is really important because as we develop code, a lot of the code that we write these days isn't our own and we're using someone else's. So um, what other, uh, who else's code are we using? Is it up to date? Uh, has it changed underneath us because uh, somebody has patched or improved it in some way? And uh, are we tracking that as it goes along? So that was the good news that we found is that most projects were using that as well. Next slide, please. So now I, I do have to say, uh, let's move on to some of the concerns there. And um, so I will uh, just sort of uh, go, give an overview of what we found. So what we what we uh, uh, categorized a lot of our concerns into were, were the following categories. The organizational, and, and they had to do not only with technical questions, but also organizational questions. Um, and, and procedural questions. What does the software management process look like? What, um, what is the organization or the mission of, um, of the, the software development team? And, and how does that impact the software development and software assurance practice? Um, yes, there, there are tools that are involved as well, including static analysis and dependency. There's testing processes. There's training of the software developers themselves in terms of robust software assurance practices. There's questions about how code is stored itself. And then there are some newer cybersecurity techniques that we'll, we'll get into as well. Next slide, please. First up, uh, first up is our, our observations about management processes. So one of the things that we, one has to do when developing software is to understand 
how robust that software needs to be with regard to a particular threat. As we think about security, we can think about uh, the, we, we have to think about the adversary at some level because it, it helps guide the amount of resources we put into assuring that software. Are we uh, writing our software to withstand a nation state attack? Are we writing our software to withstand uh, kind of more run of the mill attackers? Uh, the reality is that software assurance can run the gamut from something that could, could span that entire spectrum. And software is developed to uh, be assured to, uh, with, with uh, regard to that spectrum of threats. With scientific software, one has to, under, to decide on exactly what, where on that spectrum uh, we wish to try and design software to be assured to. And, uh, and, and write our and develop an, an assess, uh, assurance process that aligns to that particular threat. But first, we have to under we have to pick that threat, and then we have to understand based on uh, that particular level of threat what are the capabilities that our um, the adversary might have, and how do we actually develop software that will will uh, line up to those capabilities. In most of the scientific software projects we evaluated, we did not observe threat modeling being performed either formally or informally. Um, it, was, uh, it was largely simply kind of assumed to a certain extent, uh, if, if, if at all. Similarly, um, there were a lot of concerns we had around the documentation processes. Documentation for policy and process like onboarding and offboarding developers, who would be allowed to submit and approve commits to the, the code repository, and also uh, uh, documentation around code and development standards, as well as design documents was often not present. There was uh, uh, often a lack of documentation entirely. If it did exist, it was often out of date. And even if it was present and current, developers often ignored standards and requirements. Next slide, please. Um, again, there, there uh, also, while we had some positive findings with regard to avoiding use of leg legacy languages, um, a lot of Java and Python being used instead of C and C++, there's still too much ris risky code out there in use. Um, uh, so there, there were both pros and cons about this as well. Another uh, point to bring up is that even with the use of type and memory safe languages, there are still also languages that allow you to do so, too many dangerous things just because there, there are uh, the languages uh, don't have a lot of safety mechanisms built in. And so I refer here to PHP, for example, um, and even JavaScript in many cases just really lacks a lot of the safety mechanisms that one might hope for in software that would allow us to develop uh, more robust uh, and more secure code. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. Um, similarly, uh, let me move on to organization and mission. Uh, typically, we, I, we'd like to see with regard to any project of, of some kind, either an operational project or a development process, process, somebody who the buck stops with with regard to security. Who is the person who is responsible for managing or coordinating security matters? Um, generally, we found that there that projects lacked such such a person or such a, a set of people or someone who might be able to provide project management support. One of the things we found is that developers can often get too busy in the development process to sort of to think about what the coordination of security um, might look like. And so, even if you don't don't have somebody like a chief security officer who's responsible for such a thing, even having a project manager who can coordinate and remind people and, and um, periodically bring up the issue that, that we have to write our unit tests or we have to run our tools or we have to make update our documentation can be really helpful. Um, the, the organizations that we spoke with generally lacked such uh, types of people. Um, similarly, with regard to um, source code repositories, we did find that source code repositories were used and version controls tended to, to be used. On the other hand, often multi times multiple repositories might exist um, and uh, there was lack of coordination between these. And uh, so, and even when there were centralized 
repositories, there are often too many people who might exert control over a single repository rather than having a very small group of people who can scrutinize any code that was committed to the repository and improve it. There were often too many people involved with this. And, um, and so you, you, you tended to have a, a lack of uh, quality control, therefore, over the code that was ingested into that repository and then ultimately used and deployed by either uh, a, a, the team that was developing it or by other users externally. Next slide, please. Uh, and lastly, with regard to organization and mission, um, one might hope that uh, there would be audit and review re resources that could help improve the organization's security. People from uh, a university, uh, the university's central IT organization, for example, even third party uh, consultants of various kinds. However, we found many projects believed that they wouldn't benefit from this, these additional resources and felt that they had all they needed uh, on their own and chose to go it alone. Uh, and so it would have been our hope that uh, central IT resources that could be able to weigh in on software development and software assurance practices could have been used, and, and we didn't find that. All right, uh, at this point, I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, uh, Alyssa Heyman. Yeah, now I'm going to talk about what we uh, saw um, uh, related to tools. And um, program analysis tools are critical for a software project. And um, the good news is that we saw that uh, tools were used to a certain extent. The bad news is uh, that the use was a bit uh, different than uh, what it uh, should. And um, by tools, we are talking about uh, static analysis tools and that they uh, analyze a kind of a code repository. And then they have dynamic uh, tools that they monitor the execution of the program. And we also talk about uh, dependency analysis tools that warn developers when the dependencies their software is uh, based upon, like libraries or um, packages, have uh, security related uh, issues. And uh, one uh, big problem we saw here is that organizations use tools, but they are a bit lost in the sense that um, they don't really know what to do with the long list of issues that the tool may report. And they need help as for uh, using the tools more uh, in a more effective way. And as for uh, dependency tools, organizations use those tools uh, like more frequently, but they tend to use the tool that is kind of easy to use rather than the one that is uh, more effective. Like for example, a tool that is uh, integrated with GitHub that's uh, kind of easier to do because it just, um, let's say the results were bought in a way, but um, we, we saw that, uh, that those tools had kind of limitations. And organizations are unaware of things like, for example, the way they, uh, the developer format code may affect the results um, um, given by an automated assessment. And um, now as for uh, testing. I mean, testing, we all know that before, uh, releasing the software is a super critical activity. And of course, all organizations perform some kind of testing, but uh, it was a bit concerning that testing uh, was reported to be done in a more uh, ad hoc way. And um, that's um, problematic. You know, most of, I mean, everybody reported doing uh, unit testing, of course, and uh, but that was uh, oriented um, towards testing the functionality of the software. And uh, before I talk a bit more about that, uh, we need to mention that testing was mostly manual rather than um, using automated testing. I mean, some organizations were doing certain um, automatic testing to some extent, but uh, not all of them as you one would expect. And we need to distinguish between testing for functionality and testing for uh, security. Like, okay, is my program reporting, I mean, uh, delivering the right results? That's one thing, but 
even when my program is delivering the right results, may my program be uh, attacked or used to have access to other organizations. And uh, we saw that um, kind of the vast majority of the testing but was oriented towards testing for correctness and not testing for security. And many organizations even reported that they weren't uh, really aware of how to, how to do that. And uh, one more issue to mention uh, regarding testing is that in almost all cases, we saw that testing was uh, carried out by the same developers. And that's also an issue because the, the I mean, developers are can not help but being biased towards their own code. And also, you know, you cannot see your own blind spot. So we, we didn't see kind of um, independent testing group, I mean, separate from um, people uh, performing the, the development. And now we we'll move on to talk about training. And training is a um, key activity, right? That will result in developers producing sec secure software. But um, the majority of um, the groups we uh, talk with reported that their developers never receive any formal security related training. And they either learn security about security in an informal way, like a bit from here, a bit from there, or actually they didn't learn about security at all. And then when we were talking about Okay, and what about getting some training um, now? And then, oops, well, there were a lot of hurdles for, um, and for that. Like some groups didn't find uh, training being kind of uh, really useful. Or, and in any case, security training is expensive. It's expensive um, means uh, not only money-wise, but time-wise, right? Because, I mean, you are saying, okay, your developers won't be, you know, producing uh, software and you are due for your next release like last week and uh, you will have them offline learning about security so it's kind of um you know a, a, being able to afford that can can be an an issue and also if you go kind of uh, training with uh, some you know well-known kind of companies they will say okay we we'll come to your organization but for a few days we'll charge you several thousand dollars and also, uh, it's um, organizations say that they don't really find the training specifically tailored for their needs. And the fact is uh, that they basically actually, they don't understand, fully understand the, the relevance of training. And as for um, code storage, um, well, here we are talking about uh, code repositories and software version controls. And I shall talk a bit about that, so I won't um, linger over here. But um, we saw that despite the fact that almost every organization use um, a GitHub like a uh, system for, uh, for um, a, a handle their, their software, there are not much um, well established procedures for um for determining okay when, when it is okay to um contribute to the repository or um like for example we say it's not like any team member or even worse any other person can um can uh, upload code into the the repository right there should be procedures that check not only for style and uh, functionality but also for uh, security issues uh, introduced either uh, unintentionally or uh, on purpose as, as an attack. And um, there is a, 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 there was kind of a um, serious problem about kind of using and let's say abusing, using way too many um, a third party code. And that's, um, but, that, that's also connected to what I was mentioning before, 
about using uh, dependency tools. And for the sake of time, I'll um, just con uh, move on. And um, one more thing I'll be uh, talking about now is, um, okay, I mean, for, um, for let's say, a good relationship um, with the you know, software provider, software user, th there has to be um, communication, right? And the users should be able to have a mechanism to tell the software development that if they have found uh, issues with the software, I mean, either both um, functional or security related issues, and then the, the software team should have a mechanism for kind of tracking those issues and um, telling the, the users about uh, how there are, they were fixed, or also uh, mentioning, um, Mentioning if there is a security related issue with the, with the software and the step that the users uh, should take. And um, some of our observations here were that um, were that people kind of uh, tend to take kind of some of uh, shortcuts, right? Like um, like two-factor authentication was used when it was essentially required, but, um, but not uh, when it was kind of a bit more, more optional. And it's, it's not like kind of everybody should be able, you know, to, uh, as I was saying before, to make um, to, uh, a commit into the repository, right? So that those things uh, should be kind of, should be uh, really addressed. And some other technical, uh, kind of uh, technological um, uh, improvements is like, uh, for example, um, use a security stored password. And those were kind of avoided maybe sometimes because they didn't, the groups didn't find that super useful or because groups they just uh, didn't trust. Those. But uh, you are up with slides. Now. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, Sean earlier mentioned uh, threats, and I want to show you now a little bit how we think about them. In our approach to assessing uh, how people are developing software and approach to assessing this, the security of systems, um, we uh, and how scientific projects work, we organize our thinking around the, th the kinds of threats a system can encounter. So I want to talk a little bit about that thinking to show you where, uh, how, we, how we talk to the groups and how we actually end up making future suggestions. Next slide, please. So um, just a little bit of a simple example and some key questions. Um, this is a canonical kind of service you might apply, you know, with probably a web interface. Maybe it's a, some other kind of uh, client interface, but web is pretty con common. Uh, what we call business logic here could be your scientific computations, your, your, local, your local data stores, your computing, your back end of whatever service you're providing. And then there may be some external services that are outside your little local, that dotted line. Um, so, um, so the first question you might ask is, um, what do you control? Next, next please. Um, so here, it looks really simple, but we drew a box around these two processes, these are things you control, they're in your server room, you control what's the software, the hardware, and, everything. and so what level of trust you put on to those is important. And next, please. And then the question is, what don't you control? You don't control um, what's an external service is used. Maybe it's a service you decide to trust, maybe not. You have to make a risk assessment and a policy decision about that. And you don't control whatever the user does. So if, if, you're, if your service downloads a bunch of JavaScript into the user's code, you have to assume the user can arbitrarily modify what's running in their browser and send back anything and double check it again in the server. So this mentality of setting up trust boundaries. So uh, next, please. So, um, so you might trust the code that runs in your web server because you put it there. Um, next, please. But you're likely don't trust 
um, the code, the JavaScript that you downloaded in the web browser. So this is a very simple, I'm giving you very simple examples, but once you start in this way of thinking, you start discovering a lot of good and hope maybe perhaps bad characteristics about how you've just, how you've laid out your system. Okay, next please. So, um, so let's, let's think about one more important thing, which is the attack service, next please. And you need to think about all the external ways that somebody gets into your software. And so, um, and this is, and this is, this is often, it looks very obvious here, but it's often a very subtle, interesting problem. Um, in fact, you may ask, why is the database server an attack service and I write everything to it and I only read back what I write? Why is that a, uh, an attack, a part of the attack service where people can get to me? And that's a good question and we'll happy to talk with you offline longer about it. But that's the kinds of things that we want you thinking about, it's the kind of things that, that were in our mind when we started approaching these groups and evaluating what they're doing. So, um, talking. Uh, so I want to. We want to talk about now. Switch over to best practices. So next, please. And Sean, it's back to you. I'm sorry. One more slide. Excuse me. Um, so uh, when we were thinking about when we were thinking about our work and when we approached our 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 thinking about what could bad happen to groups uh, to understand how they were doing, we split it up into these interesting categories. And we've got this nice definition from NIST about what a, what a threat is. Uh, it's basically a bad thing uh, by unauthorized access, destruction, disclosure, modification, or denial of service. So uh, next, please. So we split these into categories. Um, the first one is one that can affect your software, but also is more affecting your human aspect, um, which is exploiting humans, phishing, spear phishing, dropping memory sticks in the parking lot and seeing if people pick them up and plug them in. Um, next, please. The one where you might spend a lot of time thinking about and where we can, we've given a lot of advice is, have you designed the software? And what practices, what practices are your software teams dealing with and uh, in dealing with these common things like injections and overflows and um, uh, web, web security? Next, please. Now, there, uh, there's also thinking about how different components interact with each other. Yes, is your, is your software coded well, but, um, how are you dealing with your external interfaces and your internal interfaces? Can people um, replay messages uh, even if they're encrypted and cause something bad to happen? It's a surprisingly powerful attack technique. Can they do password attacks? Can they do uh, sniffing of the data if things aren't properly encrypted? Next, please. Alyssa mentioned uh, dependency tools. Uh, we, this is what we call our software supply chain. What are you dependent upon? What libraries, packages, other things, external tools are you using? If somebody attacks one of your dependencies, um, and we've seen several of these attacks in the recent years, really significant ones, then you're just as vulnerable even though you didn't write the code. You're using the code and you might be vulnerable because of that. And the last category to think about is actually a harder one, next please, um, which is, uh, design. You may code so carefully, but if your design has inherent flaws in how you do your authentication or how you do um, your data checking, then you might, in fact, uh, not be able to build a secure system. You have to back up to thinking about the early parts of the design. And now, um, I think, uh, we'll, next please, we'll turn this over to Sean to start talking about um, thoughts about best practices. Thanks very much, Bart. Okay, so we've talked about uh, some of the problems that we've identified in scientific software development, and we've talked about some of the threats that can capitalize on those problems. So let's talk about some of the potential solutions to help mitigate those problems. Next slide, please. Starting off where, we, uh, where, I, where I ended previously on organization. Um, as I mentioned, organizations need to establish a lead role someone who is the point person, the gatekeeper, who, where the buck stops at for secured software design. That person also needs to advise, advise both leadership above the software development, as well as stakeholders of any potential risk at any point in the software's life cycle. 
This, by the way, also relates to what we call one of the musts as part of the trusted CI framework. If you're not familiar with that, check that out as well. That's an important op uh, uh, document for scientific computing in general and uh, securing scientific systems. And it's specifically must number seven. Related to that, the, this, per, this cybersecurity lead needs to involve leadership and cybersecurity decision-making as well. This is often also one of the musts in the trusted CI framework. And the importance of this is twofold. First, leadership simply needs to know about the risks and not be surprised by them. Second of all, the uh, leadership is the ultimate uh, 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 decision maker about risks. The security uh, lead should advise management and management should, should uh, make the ultimate decision on which risks should be accepted and which, which risks should be mitigated. Uh, in addition, pro project managers are vital for helping manage se secure software development. As I mentioned, it's, it's great to have a security lead and it's important. Whether or not that security lead exists, a project manager can also help. Um, uh, the uh, developers get caught up in coding and they forget about deadlines and, and other elements uh, and communicating with the, the community, for example, and the project manager can, can be vital for that. Lastly, with regard to uh, on this slide anyhow, uh, principle of least privilege. Access rights should be limited within the project according to the needs of, and responsibilities of individual uh, individuals' positions. We found so many cases where everybody had access to do everything, and segmentation of access, limiting the, the rights of people uh, to do individual things can help reduce problems. This, this doesn't just reduce malicious uh, uh, issues, this can help reduce accidents as well. Uh, and this, this even comes up in my own life. I don't want super user access to any system that I don't actually have to have super user access uh, to. Why uh, uh, create another uh, vulnerability? Next slide, please. Leadership has another really important role as well. And this is instilling a culture of security in some way that, that isn't seen as a burden. So often uh, we see uh, security chiefs come in and say, thou shalt do X and thou shall not do X, uh, X and Y. Um, and uh, what, what can be uh, fantastic is the a leader of an organization who helps uh, assure that the, uh, the employees in an organization, the people who are, who are contributing to an organization in some way, understand the need for security, but um, uh, pass this responsibility on in a way that's not just seen as yet another burden. Uh, it's seen as an important and, and a fundamental element of, of the task. And so uh, lack of security can culture, culture can come from, uh, from having negative experiences in the past uh, or just having seen something work without uh, having to take on uh, additional practices. But if leadership can instill that, that, that culture from the top down, it can really help improve security of software development. Uh, finally, with regard to organization, documentation. Documentation is so important. Um, the, uh, it, it's it's all, always the case uh, that um, uh, we, we did that uh, we've been taught as software developers that we're supposed to write comments in our code, but so often, um, you know, these, these comments are, are, uh, uh, aren't, aren't enough, they aren't kept up to date, we don't have documentation about processes and procedures that go beyond just software development. Um, and, uh, you know, any process that starts with one person saying, I, I, I bet I can just keep this all in one, my head, you know, so many of the times these, these processes inevitably grow and become much bigger. And um, having the documentation in place to support that as, as a project evolves and new people come on board and people come on go is so important. Bart? Great. Thank you. Next, please. <clears throat> so, um, Melissa earlier mentioned training and um, this is an area that's essential and you just cannot leave it to chance. So um, the goal is to figure out what, what works for you. Um, Cause every organization has different needs, different mixtures, languages, different structures. So it's important to set expectations and policies for it. So you can have a lot of choices of where you can get training. You can, um, you might find it, um, you know, you might create it in house if you're a organization with the resources to do it. Um, uh, you might internally create it. You might bring in outside trainers in. That's ex that's that can be expensive. By the way, talk to us. We 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 often help with training. That's a way to uh, deal with costs. You might go to conferences and workshops, and uh, some conferences like supercomputing have a very strong uh, educational program. Other conferences you you have to check out, but that can be a great way to get 
uh, training. You can bring professional, you can go to professional tutorials, the same companies that come in, um, schedule them in places. Though again, that's expensive, but could be good. And hey, don't be afraid to use your local university if you can, if you can commit the time to take a course, which is actually uh, a, a big ask. Next, please. Now, we've been working on a lot of training resources that are available um, in the area of software security. Uh, this, this URL will take you to this page where you can, you can get videos, text chapters, hands-on exercises. And if you're an instructor, there's a link to instructor resources that we can give for, for quizzes and um, other in-class exercises. Um, we also teach uh, extensively in-person tutorials at meetings, come in-house to organizations, um, you know, conferences, workshops, things like that. So um, uh, please think about us when it comes to software security, software assurance training. Um, maybe we can help out. Next, please. Well, what you need to do as an organization is basically you need to stop for a second and say, what is it that we need? What is it? Where is the places where we have gaps? Um, you can bring outside groups to help you find those gaps. You can do it yourself. You need to have a plan, a specific plan to overcome these gaps. Set up reasonable expectations about how much time you can take away from your development developers and how much you can spend and then start taking action. Don't delay on this. The sooner you start it, the, the sooner you start filling in the gaps and building a culture, a greater culture of security. Okay, I'm gonna turn this back over to Alyssa to talk about tools. We were mentioning um, that tools help, help um, developers find uh, issues in their program. And those issues include security related issues. So what should you do um, on this uh, area? Well, first use tools. And the easiest way to start with is uh, using dependency analysis tool. And um, as I was mentioning before, those will find um, already existing and known vulnerabilities in the dependencies uh, your project are using, basically in third party software. And um, there are tools for uh, many languages, um, almost for, actually for every language. And actually there are tools that are good for different, like, several languages. For example, Sneak here is good for uh, li this list of languages. And uh, what we have here on the, um, Right bottom corner is an example of the output uh, generated by the OWASP dependency check. And uh, in short, there are many tools and uh, there are tools for every language. Then um, a bit more uh, time consuming and challenging, but also uh, very needed, use static analysis tools. And uh, those tools will scan um, the program uh, source uh, byte or binary code, and uh, they will check for different kinds of issues. As in this talk, we care about security related issues. And uh, what kind of issues that, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's not that if you use a tool, you'll have a one click security and you have um, um, a silver bullet. No, but it will help uh, you to find um, buffer overruns, some kind of injections. If you web, if you are dealing with a web application, um, kind of cross-site scripting issues, cross-site request forgery, and um, some other security-related issues that uh, will make your program uh, vulnerable. And you need to start using uh, tools from day one. Tools have a kind of issues. They will give you a, maybe a large number of um, reports, several kind of problems, and you will have to go through all of them and see which one are real, which one are not. I mean, again, it's not perfect, but it's uh, something that will be very helpful for your project, and you should do that uh, from day one. And uh, remember, if you didn't see uh, the language you were using on the list I had a couple of slides uh, before, don't worry. There are tools for every language you can imagine. So you are good. And a third step, which is uh, way more advanced, 
is to use the dynamic, dynamic analysis tools. And those tools monitor your program while it's running. So it actually only covers the exercise uh, path of your application. And that those are a bit uh, more challenging to use, but um, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt, hurt at all using those. But you need to check the language, the tool that works for your language. And uh, here uh, there is a resource where you can, when you can get uh, information about that. And I'll move um, on to talk about um, um, uh, code, code releases. And uh, here um, there is no question. I mean, use a centralized version control and uh, Git related tools like GitHub, GitLab are super uh, are, are popular, kind of almost everybody uses those. And that's good. I mean, you want to use um, you want to use those tools because code is a dynamic thing. And uh, you know, it goes uh, go through updates, fixes, and you want to that process to happen kind of in a controlled way. And we want also always to be able to uh, get provenance information for the updates that happen that happen to the code, and that should um, be in in a, a controlled way. And uh, the code that um, is going to be um, kind of uploaded should uh, be safe of uh, bugs that were intentionally or unintentionally uh, introduced, and things that uh, you would like to pay attention to is, for example, kind of to have a process to prevent, you know, kind of passwords or critical tokens to go into the code that, that can uh, then be exfiltrated by uh, anybody, right? Or also a feature, probably features is not the word, that will allow you to uh, lateral movement within that organization. And as I was mentioning before, use two-factor authentication to uh, keep uh, access control of the code uh, repository. And as for uh, branches, super important use, um, of course, we all know there should be a different branch for um, production software and for uh, development software. But in addition to that, there should be a separate branch for testing, right? And uh, that, that branch should be different from the from when you introduce new functionality in the code, right? So by the doing that, um, the users will be able to update to secure to more secure versions once a vulnerabilities are discovered without um, jeopardizing what I mean the, the the functionality they are relying on. And um, as for the process of managing uh, vulnerabilities. Oops, we are running short in, in time. So probably I'll keep on. Um, this, this is back to Sean. Thanks very much, uh, Barton Alista. Uh, next slide, please. Going back to cryptography, uh, cryptography is such an important element of all modern software in terms of the of authentication and communication and, and, uh, and other elements in, in software. And so it's important to get it right. So for those reasons, we, we came up with a number of, of um, succinct but vital recommendations. There's lots of training out there, both written and in video, to, to, to learn how to educate programmers in whatever language they use. It's important that you do. Know when to use cryptography, though. Not all we don't always need to use cryptography um, when uh, in, in every situation. If we're sending uh, uh, terabytes or exabytes of data or something like that, as we often do in software, uh, we we need to remember that cryptography is expensive computationally, and maybe we shouldn't be using it in every single circumstance. Of course, as I mentioned before, don't try and write your own cryptography code. It's really hard to do. Just don't try it. Use the libraries that exist out there. There's just too many errors that can come up. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. 
Yeah, 34. And That's lastly, when you do use cryptography, be sure to keep that code up to date. There's often weaknesses uh, that, that are found uh, in existing libraries, or there may be bugs that are found in implementation. So regardless of whether you do use a, a particular piece of software or not, be sure to actually keep that, that software, out, both the, the implementation up to date, as well as the algorithm. Algorithms uh, give me, um, uh, get uh, or become weak due to increases in computing power and need to stay up to date. We don't use DES or SHA-1 anymore because uh, uh, computers have gotten faster and they can be easily broken. And uh, of course, be careful where you store your keys. If an attacker uses a copy, they can potentially expose encrypted material or alter signed material uh, impersonating you. So just in the same way we hear about people losing access to their Bitcoins or somebody uh, compl uh, compromising those, keep your crypto keys for the code that you, you develop uh, uh, safe as well. And be careful how you, you, how you create them. Make sure they're long enough to actually be uh, uh, so sufficient to support whatever type of cryptography you're using. If they're not long enough, they can be broken. Bart? So, yeah, next please. So we covered a lot of territory. We showed you this at the beginning. Um, this, this is where you can dig in and find all the, fill in all the gaps uh, for all the, all the stuff we have discussed today. The first one is the background on what we learned by uh, talking with a lot of the projects about what they did. And then we've built this guide, this living guide that you can use to actually help shape your software development process and figure out what practices there are. And of course, we're always here as a resource. Okay, next slide, please. Um, next again, please. So software assurance is an ongoing, is an ongoing effort and um, you, can, uh, uh, you can follow what we're doing. Uh, the software guide is going to be expanded and refined, and we'd love to get your feedback on it and your contributions to it. We're going to continue teaching and uh, our software uh, security and training. Um, we'll be expanding the content and continue to reach out and teach tutorials and in-person virtual. We we also come into organizations as part of the trusted CI engagement process and do in-depth assessments of your code. Um, uh, please feel free. To talk to us about such things. And we're actually jumping into the ransomware ring and developing a threat model for that to talk about. So we've covered a lot of territory. Next slide, please. And now we wanna give you folks a chance to ask questions, um, give us feedback or whatever you think for the rest of the time. Great, thank you. We've got a few minutes. So why don't, um, if you have a question, go ahead and type it in the chat. And I'll just say that um, thank you very much, Abhi, um, uh, Bart, um, Sean, and Alyssa for presenting. We really appreciate your experience and you coming together to, um, to speak to our community. Um, I will be posting a, a copy of this video, hopefully later today, but if not uh, tomorrow morning at the, at the latest, uh, as well as slides and, and the other various links that we discussed in the presentation today. Um, we do have a webinar planned for March, but I don't have a speaker officially secured yet. We're working on it. We're very excited about this speaker, but I can't uh, publish it yet. So uh, stay tuned for more information about that. And do we have any more, any questions from the audience? Well, I, I, I think you should congratulate yourselves. I think you guys have answered a lot of uh, maybe outstanding questions that people may have had with the, with the presentation itself, uh, especially the tools and the advice that you gave toward the end. Um, so with that, I want to thank everybody for attending today's presentation. And uh, again, thank you to our presenters, um, Alyssa, Sean, and Bart. Um, with that, I will end the meeting and uh, I hope you guys have a great day. Um, any, any last minute comments from, from you presenters? Uh, as you said, feel free, please, to contact us if you have any follow-up questions or issues you want us to talk to you about. We're happy to, to, to do that. Yes. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great day. <laughs>